My name is Charles Durrett, and I coined the word co-housing many years ago, and with Catherine McCammett brought it to the U.S. If you consider the three key components to quality of life, staying healthy, um, eating right, um, staying active, and staying connected, those, um, those notions are best, very much facilitated by living in a functioning community like co-housing, I think. So I want to start off by saying that um, uh, the big idea is the notion that we're going to create neighborhoods in the U.S. that are high functioning. And we're not just going to. We have already built about 160 now in the U.S. Co-housing, like community itself, is not a new idea. It's very much an old idea. The difference is it used to happen very naturally. Now it has to happen very deliberately. Now it's a conscious act. Um, you know, I actually grew up in a small town. That's my grandmother there in the pink pants in Downeyville, California. Um, and those towns happened just by virtue of the fact that everybody didn't drive to everywhere they went. They very much relied on proximity to accommodate many of the uh, needs of the day, and, um, and that has subsided very much. I got involved with co-housing for lots of good reasons, <laughs> for lots of reasons. One of them was I wanted to live in co-housing, so once I had seen it in Europe, I said, okay, that's how I'm, I want to live, no doubt. But also because we won the, the uh, Human Habitat Award from the UN in 2001. And when they called me up and said, you won, I said, no, that's, not, that's impossible. They always give it to somebody from the Philippines or South Africa or something like that. And they said, no, no, we decided this year that the Americans are the locusts on the planet and you guys are trying to do something about it. So, so we got the award that year. You know, we do consume more than we should. And I think co-housing and via cooperation does mitigate that to some extent. Um, and then what we do kind of manage to do with those resources is, um, is uh, you know, can be consequential. For example, you know, I, I live in co-housing. I feel like I have a lot of excess time because I live there because, you know, life is more convenient. Somebody else is making dinner, that makes that makes life more convenient. Somebody else is mowing the lawn, life is more convenient. If people often ask me, you know, Chuck, what is the common denominator here? Is there any spirituality of some kind that I'm missing, et cetera? And the only thing I've ever been able to come up with is that people feel like their own personal life is gonna be better if they give cooperation with their neighbor the benefit of the doubt, actually. Not that we do it all the time. We, you know, we do it all by consensus. Can, you know, the cooperation. Not too long ago, there was somebody in our community who wanted to buy a pickup truck together. We had owned it together, and you, you would pay commensurate to how much you used it, but we would co-own them. And lots of co-housing groups have done that. But anyway, everybody said, no, 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 and we didn't do it. Um, and just the fact that he could ask his neighbors could we do that, is unique to co-housing. If you knock, if you go down the street of a single family house neighbor and you knock on people's doors and you go, hey, you wanna buy a pickup together? You wanna buy a pickup together? I think it'd be about 10 minutes before somebody would call the police on you. I mean, so basically the only common denominator is that people feel like they can cooperate if they can get consensus on it. You know, uh, we did a project in downtown Tokyo a few years ago. Tokyo, 27 million people, right? And we had, 20 people at the very first uh, um, workshop, you know, a couple hundred people at the presentation, but 20 people came to the all weekend workshop on how to get a new co-housing started in Tokyo. Marveled at the fact that all of them were from the villages far outside of Tokyo. People who had actually grown up in a place where knowing your neighbor meant something to your quality of life basically. And um, it was just blew my mind that, um, that nobody from Tokyo was there, 27 million people, and all the 20 people were, um, grew up in Muras, small villages in the uh, distant, distant uh, islands. You know, the eco-village movement, like in Europe, is very much uh, uses co-housing as a, as a key component to creating the eco-village. So we just finished a project in Chilliwack, BC, British Columbia, that um, is 25 acres. Um, on that 25 acres is 33-unit uh, intergenerational co-housing, 17-unit senior co-housing, 30,000 square foot of commercial space, and a 20-acre farm. 
where bunch of the, bunches and bunches of the people who live in the co-housing actually farm there. And part of the commercial is selling the farm product, produce there. So, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to see, how, and they, their, their key organizing component was co-housing. They started with the intergenerational co-housing. And that made so much sense to me because when you're gonna try to do other things cooperatively, you know, the co-housing movement has very successfully um, organized around people cooperating. These are folks who simply are getting skilled and have chosen to embrace cooperation as a means of having a higher quality of life and um, are, are accomplishing it. And so, you know, the challenge around eco-villages and anything else um, where people are trying to go further, you know, there's an old saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And these are people who want to actually take things further than they could certainly take things by themselves. Um, Co-housing so projects have a much better track record than typical developers because, you know, you have 20 people in the room that says, you know, let's get this built. You have, you know, 30 seniors in the room that say, hey, I don't even buy green bananas anymore. Let's get this built. And it changes the complexion of, a, of, a, of, of the entitlement process, the approval process. So. Um, but it's funny because, or it's not funny because um, so often it comes down to the creativity of the, of the group themselves. When Bill McKibben, when I asked Bill McKibben, you know, an environmentalist of consequence in this country today, I, when I asked him to write the forward to our book, he said, oh, no problem. And he says, you know, Chuck, I'm not in that impressed. I am, I'm impressed, but it's not. The, the, the focus of, of my interest that you guys save so much energy, energy in co-housing. What amazes me is when I walk into a co-housing community, how much energy you seem to be creating. And it's not just the solar panels. It's the residents who are sitting around talking about the issues of the day and figuring out how to plug into the larger community as well as their own community. Over and over again, you hear neighbors who say, I'm so much more interested and involved in my larger neighborhood now that I live in co-housing than I was before I lived in co-housing. Because among other things, I'm aware. I'm aware of things uh, that are, you know, why they're closing that child care center, why they're closing that uh, senior adult center, um, that I wasn't, I didn't really have a, a clue of previously. I didn't, did not know how to get involved with previously, but now in the, in the context of of developing uh, this project and living in this project, I have become very, very aware. It's so easy as an individual to not do the right thing. It's harder when you get all of that consciousness in the room to just simply not do the right thing. The only ideology of consequence in co-housing tends to be that people feel like they will, in fact, get uh, more out of life if they cooperate with their neighbors than if they don't. Thank you guys very much for coming. Appreciate it.